It has been a tumultuous year for Twitter, to say the least. After much back and forth, Elon Musk bought the company, laid off thousands of employees, and reframed how Twitter would do business. Now Twitter is trying to navigate its way through the firings of its deputy general counsel and how it handled a Hunter Biden story during the 2020 election campaign. At the heart of the controversy is Twitter's decision in October 2020 to block users from sharing a New York Post story containing material from a laptop belonging to Hunter Biden. Molly Jongfast joins me now. She's a special correspondent for Vanity Fair. All right, Molly, thanks for being with us this Christmas. Tell me, did Elon Musk find a smoking gun when he looked into Twitter's files on how the Hunter Biden story was handled? I mean, I think that Twitter sort of admitted they mishandled it. I mean, they. I think there was a lot of regret. Again, I'm not sure that the story of the son of the president's laptop is so is so explosive. But I do think that um, Elon has spent a lot of time on it. Right? He had a bunch of different writers release threads and threads and threads and a lot of writing on it. Um, there were a lot of, it was set up in a very salacious way. So uh, there was a lot of attention paid to it. I didn't see anything that was so shocking. I mean, towards the end, these revelations about uh, the FBI and and perhaps, you know, there, there's a lot of like very murky stuff that could have, that may have been bad. And again, you know, the sort of military stuff and uh, you know, again, I would say it was not the, I, I mean, I'm curious to know all the other stuff. Like I wondered about the other things we haven't seen that weren't released. And well, the release documents show Twitter's recently fired Deputy General Counsel James Baker, of course, the former top FBI attorney, was in regular contact with his former colleagues at the FBI. Is that part of what's fueling the conspiracies uh, amid the company's critics? I mean, it's not so unusual to have people from the government go and work in private companies. I, I'm not defending the FBI by any stretch of the imagination here. I, I think that the way it's set up is very salacious, the way they've been releasing the documents. But I'm curious to know, like, what was Twitter's relationship with all these authoritarian governments? I mean, what were, you know, what other things had they done? You know, I'm a little curious about the story, but I'm curious about everything else. Like, if you're going to release all of Twitter's documents, why not release them all? You know, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff there that doesn't pass the smell test. And so I would say I think it, it hurts him in a way because this is so clearly very partisan. And I would be curious about, you know, even in some of the other threads, the writers will say, uh, you know, well, there was this happened with both campaigns. So I'd be curious to know what else they had. Yeah, because of course, we think back to 2016 and disinformation campaigns by foreign adversaries. These documents show Twitter was trying to root out foreign disinformation during the 2020 election. With Elon Musk now running the company, uh, do you think that Twitter is more or less susceptible to these kind of foreign disinformation campaigns? I mean, I think we're going to have to see. Look, you know, this is not a great situation, I think, because he's so um, he seems very uh, I think he seems to have a, a horse in this race. Right. You really want a CEO who just cares about getting information out there that is legitimate, you know, that doesn't let foreign actors get involved, that makes sure, you know, things that are trending are actually like, new, you know, pieces of news that are verified and not, you know, conspiracy theories. Um, I think it's really too soon to see, but he certainly has his finger on the scale and he has a political point of view. And I'm not sure that helps with the larger problems of content moderation.